Welcome. We're going to give everyone a few minutes to arrive. Um, I say a few minutes, I probably mean more like 30 seconds to arrive. So um, get situated and comfortable. And we're absolutely delighted that you've joined us today. Um, this is, I hope, going to be a timely and helpful session for everyone. We're going to start at 12.02. Um, so if you need to do something, you have a couple minutes. Welcome for those who are just joining. Mm -hmm. Welcome everyone. We're going to get started in two minutes, uh, probably uh, twelve oh two. Um, so if there's anything you need to do to get comfortable and set up, please take the moment to do it. Um, I look forward to getting started in just a second. Hey, we're going to get started in just a few seconds here. Um, thank you so much for joining um, during uh, what for many of you is probably your lunch hour. So I hope that you are comfortable and well situated and perhaps even have lunch with you as we um, dive into today's topic. Um, I am Kate Ebner, the CEO and founder of the Nebo Company and uh, also a leadership coach and um organizational development strategist. I work with many different kinds of organizations and I'm delighted to be bringing this topic to you today. Um, before I, I jump into it, I'd like to introduce my colleague, Ann Foley. Um, Ann is a vice president of client experience at the Nebo Company. She leads our education practice and Ann is gonna help us today as um, you are participating through the chat. She's gonna help me make sure that I see your comments and have a chance to um, respond or acknowledge some of what you're putting into the chat. This is a webinar versus a, a Zoom meeting, which so many of us are used to. I think what that means is that we, we aren't gonna be able to have much of a verbal discussion, but the chat can be a lively place for you to comment, or add a perspective or ask a question. So I would just encourage you to, um, to use the chat that way. And um, we're gonna be recording today's webinar. Uh, we'll also be sending you this recorded webinar and this uh, material that you're looking at as I'm working my way through this um, program. Uh, I hopefully that will be something that comes in handy for you as you continue to think about the topic. So, um, as we get started, you know, you'll notice the title of our of our program, Developing Transformational Leaders for the 2020s, Onboarding New Leaders in Today's Fast-Moving Workplace. And I want to just say for a moment that um, this topic of how to support new leaders who are stepping up has really been a dominant theme of the spring of 2023 and right on into the summer. And for that reason, uh, we thought it would be potentially helpful to share some of what we're seeing, what we know, um, and what's, what might be helpful to you. So with no further ado, I want to introduce the whole series and very much these webinars, today's webinar, then of course, September 12th, we'll be talking about what's changed about developing leaders since 2020. And we'll be sharing ways in which the old paradigms of leadership are no longer serving today's leaders, um, what's changed in what in terms of the type of leadership needed, what's changed in terms of the context for leading. Um, I think this is going to be a fascinating and interesting um, session for, for us all. Um, the third webinar is keeping key leaders at critical times. What can you do to retain, energize, and renew your top leaders in your organization? Um, again, a, a topic that's emerging from what we're seeing 
out in the world in 2023 across numerous organizations. Um, I want to introduce the Nebo Company. Uh, I mentioned um, early on that I'm the CEO and founder of the Nebo Company. I'm also a leadership coach, facilitator, program designer, and organization development strategist. Um, I named the Nebo Company back in 2004 after Lake Nebo, a hidden lake in the Adirondack Mountains. And one of the things that, that we often say about the name Nebo is that a Nebo is the place where you feel most at one with yourself and the world. And so that place where, you know, when you're in that beautiful setting, for some people, it's the Outer Banks. For somebody else, it might be, um, you know, uh, uh, another geography, the the, the high desert. Um but when you're in that place, you feel the most like you. Nebo to us is a metaphor. It's the lake within us. It's that place where we can find our center and bring resilient centered presence and leadership. And so when we think about how we do our work at the Nebo company, we really operate from the belief that we can we have within ourselves what we need in order to meet the very challenging and complex uh, sets of issues that we face every day. So a little bit about our background and about the name of the Nebo Company. The Nebo Company, the Nebo Company's lake is a real place. It's in the Adirondacks of New York State and uh, not too far from where I am today. A couple other things about us. Um, our work as a company is to prepare leaders and organizations to navigate and thrive in complexity and in these particular 2020s, right? Uh, we believe that better leaders are essential for a better future. And we also know that this is a time when it's not easy to be uh, seen as a leader, to, to be seen as in charge. Um, our mission is to develop human potential to transform the future. And we're a full service coaching and leadership development firm with a network of more, about a hundred incredible leadership coaches and facilitators. Um, we deliver coaching certainly, but also uh, transformative leadership programs, strategic visioning, and we also do a fair amount of um, organization and talent development work with our clients. Um, I am uh, play many roles. I wear many hats. Um, I've been doing this uh, for now for almost 20 years. And prior to that, was a leader in higher education and a change leader, a strategy consultant, a chief people officer. So I'm coming to the today's topic with a background in organization development, people development. And uh, I want to say how we grow our organizations to meet the evolving needs that they're facing both internally and externally. So we're going to start with just a, a little bit of a perspective. Um, there's wide variance in the attention given to onboarding across companies, and yet effective onboarding may determine whether or not a new leader succeeds. In 2022, there was actually a study that showed um, that in the part of the pandemic, companies with onboarding were doing a 50% better job of retaining new hires than those without strong onboarding. Um, it's interesting to think about how invested we are or could be in our onboarding approach. Today, we're going to talk about some best practices for executive onboarding, and we're going to specifically zoom in on the role that onboarding coaching can play in a leader's successful transition. There are a few things I'd like you to take from today, um, or at least I hope that you'll take from today. Uh, the first is just uh, insight about the trends we're seeing in 2023 related to leadership transitions and getting talented leaders into the positions and thriving in the positions as quickly as possible? What are we noticing about the conditions in which those leaders step in? Um, we also want to share a bit about what a strong onboarding program could look like or could include. Um, we're gonna talk about how to use onboarding coaching as a key strategy in your approach and why to do that. Um, and then finally, <coughs> excuse me, I'd like to share some guidelines very simple guidelines on how to evaluate the success of your program for a key leader. So that's ambitious for the amount of time we have. I'm going to jump right in. Um, I'll start with the 2023 tw trends. And, you know, it's, you know, when does something become a trend? Well, very often it's when, for me at least, it's when I'm noticing it everywhere, everywhere I go, every organization I'm working in, numerous leaders I'm coaching or speaking with. Um, I'm hearing people talk about it. Out, out in social environments. And then I research it and discover that it's happening universally. And so I just wanted to point to a few things that you may also be noticing. 
First, we'll start with the big picture. We all know, I think, that these are VUCA times, volatile, uncertain, complex, and ambiguous. The term VUCA comes from sort of the Cold War era. It's very much back in play. We've been describing a VUCA environment really since before the pandemic and, and certainly in the pandemic. What does it mean? Um, what it, it means that we are um, meeting some unprecedented challenges. And, and, a, and I would say it's not just one thing, it's everything, right? It's the acceleration of technology innovation, persistent systemic disparities, climate change, the global pandemic, which is waning but still present, the evolving future, and how we will live, love, learn, and work um, is evolving. Um, economic volatility, sort of this confusing and contradictory economy, uh, persistent inflation, war, uh, changing workforce demographics, political divisiveness, and social unrest is of often the number one concern when we're asking about people's resilience challenges. People talk about the divided nation in the, in the United States and really the divided world um, and the social unrest, the feeling that things are not right. Um, major source of challenge for leaders. Distributed teams. What does it mean to lead a team that's not uh, working side by side? Um, hybrid workplaces and more. So I probably have stressed you out a little bit putting this list of things together, but I think what I want to emphasize is that, um, you know, this is not 2010. This is not 2000. This is not 1990, right? This is 2023. And all of us are looking into a VUCA world. Those of us who are leading are uh, aligning up our organizations to be successful in very challenging conditions. So what does it mean now? Like what about 2023? What about the second half of this year? What about next year? What is it that leaders are um, are thinking about and wondering about? And I'm curious and feel free again to comment in the chat, but have you noticed, these are some of the things we've noticed that many long tenured senior leaders are announcing retirement after seeing their organizations through the worst of the pandemic. We're seeing a, a slew of people deciding that now is the moment to step down. And um, I would say uh, a deep fatigue and, and readiness for resignation or stepping back. We're seeing restlessness and a search for meaning among employees with work taking a back seat to other parts of life. Like now, you know, having been through the first three years of, of, of the 2020s, do I really need my life to work the way it was working in 2019 and before? Uh, what's really important to me, what's what what matters most. We're seeing lingering fatigue and burnout among organizational leaders, even as we're coming out of the pandemic era. I, what I noticed, and I noticed this early on in 2023, is that people knew what they needed to do, but when they went to do it, they didn't have the energy or the volition to rally everybody and do it. So it was really interesting to uh, observe um, the gap, if you will, between the desire to move things forward and literally the, the energy level and the focus available to do that. And I think it's been a, a slow start um, for many organizations in the first half of 2023. Tough, unrelenting business challenges in an emergent, confusing, and contradictory business environment with no relief in sight. So the business challenges won't get easier. Um, things are emergent. We need to be adaptive. It's confusing. And so when you're stepping up to lead, you're you're doing a, uh, an amazing commitment to making sense of a very challenging environment and being willing to take a stand for change and progress. And I, I don't mean to sound negative. I actually just think I want to acknowledge the stamina and commitment of leaders today. Um, it's a morphing workplace as we experiment with hybrid approaches, in-person policies, what it means to manage and lead a distributed workforce or a mix of the of of remote and in-person and how do we do this, right? So these are some of the trends that we've been noticing. And, you know, again, these are the environments in which um, new leaders are stepping when they say yes to taking a job, stepping into your organization. And it's really interesting to think about how your organization may be similar or different um, from the one that they have just been in, right? So the changes that we have to adapt to when we step into a new organization can be actually significantly um, different depending on the strategies that were you know, in play. Um, 
pause here. I'm noticing that there's some great comments in the chat. And is there anything you want to point to? Yeah, I mean, I, there's lots of affirmation of these points, Kate, but there's also some notes about that folks have noticed an increase in incivility, which mm. I think is a really strong contribution here. Um, and also that this is the burnout and fatigue that you're talking about is seen in senior leaders and in middle managers. Yes. Yes. Um, and just some thanks for the acknowledgement about the stamina and commitment that is being required of leaders today. It's no small thing. Yeah. Um, it's true. And and so, you know, as, as a leadership coach, um, I'm in service to the effectiveness and success of the leader I'm working with. And I noticed that that we're digging deep, right? We're digging deep inside ourselves to bring um, certainly leadership, but also uh, confidence, optimism, faith in the future, vision, right? Those things that really are the fuel of um, high-performing organizations. Oh, thank you. Um, oh, here's one more. Um, difficulty getting or gauging the stickiness of employee satisfaction and loyalty to their employer, right? So we're certainly all doing surveys and doing pulse checks and trying to understand how everybody's doing and what they need in this environment, but it can be hard to tell what the engagement uh, looks like in, in, in individual lives and also how sticky it really is. Is this a, are we in a temporary situation where we're still adapting and being creative or have we arrived in a new place? And if so, what's it like to work for our organization, right? So really interesting, hard question. Um, so new leaders entering their roles today have to hit the ground running in this VUCA environment. And the 2020s call for new leadership capabilities that are different from the past. In fact, I've had numerous people say to me, I, I put down good to great, Kate, it just doesn't do it anymore. There's <laughs> there's something missing in there. I, I need another way of thinking about our, our leadership challenges and, and how to lead. And, you know, here is a sort of a, uh, a general run through of the evolution of the concept of leadership, at least in an American perspective on it. Um, I would say in the 2020s and beyond, leaders must anticipate an emergent crisis laden future. Adaptive strategies or the need to be adaptive um, and organizational approaches that can actually shift almost week by week. You know, there's a need to be able to see what's happening and call it. Um, leaders have to be able to succeed in the near term, right now, this year, this quarter, you know, this period, harnessing technology to learn fast and communicate. They also have to be able to look far out, reading breaking news and trends and gazing unflinchingly at the future and its implications, right? So this is kind of the job for a superhero of some kind, right? <laughs> to be able to um, anticipate, pivot, um, execute, right, in the near term, and also anticipate, um, forecast, describe, envision, align, and get results, right? And so we look at the challenge and we say, okay, this is a this is a going to take full consciousness, right, to do this job well, this job of leadership. Coming on board in 2023, leaders are experiencing um, new evolutions in the workplace, the rise of workplace hubs and even live work communities. Um, these are being built around the country where people can live where they work. Um, uh, hybrid and distributed teams, um, accelerated pace enabled by technology, challenging economics and a work from anywhere around the clock workforce. In other words, you wake up in the morning and get back online things have happened in the night, right? Um, things are are happening over the weekend. You know, we're, we're, we're coping with um, a rapid pace of, um, uh, I wanna say achievement, but also um, communication, uh, more information hitting us than ever. There's an expectation of leaders to lead a diverse workforce skillfully. There's an expectation that you'll be fluent, that you'll be inclusive, that you'll understand uh, how to navigate, how to develop, how to recruit, and how to lead a diverse workforce. Um, there's an increased competition for national and global talent and new opportunities and competitive challenges that are enabled by artificial intelligence and other tech innovations. So coming on board in 2023 is actually a pretty exciting time because I think this is a time when we're learning how to do things that hadn't been previously conceived. It's a time for creativity. 
it's a time for leaders who can really catalyze their teams and their organizations to, to lift up their heads and see out and think differently and not to be afraid to innovate. And for a new leader stepping in, you need to kind of move quickly to build trust, um, to gain uh, credibility, to establish yourself, and to make sure that what you know and what you're bringing actually connects with the organization that you have joined. Um, so, you know, onboarding new leaders in the 2020s, we think about um, what they're confronting and have talked about that already. I think the second paragraph is useful here for leaders stepping into new roles. Previous successes may not predict effectiveness in the current position. Providing wraparound support in the first months is crucial to ensuring successful transition and assimilation. And it's just really interesting because I think that's one of the things I hear most often in my coaching from coach, when I'm coaching um, new, new exec, executives who are new to their positions. It's, it's wow, I, all the things I've ever done haven't quite prepared me for this, right? Or um, I've been really successful, but it's really hard to demonstrate that in this new environment, right? And so there, you know, I, I would say that it's a really interesting moment from a confidence perspective for a new leader to be able to, to, to access what you know, but also establish credibility. Um, I think it's really critical for leadership transitions to be conceived of as seamlessly as possible um, because what you really want is for someone to come in to feel supported to be connected into the system and the people and the key relationships and then ultimately to be able to move very rapidly into an effective um, leadership mode um, however research over time shows that 40 to 50 percent of new executives fail or leave the organization within 18 months um, and that impacts the bottom line and morale and you know what's interesting about that um, statistic is that it's it's been researched in a variety of places and in a variety of ways, and it consistently comes out between let's say forty and fifty five percent. And so it's you know in effect one in two people who are hired into important new roles are not going to succeed. What happens or doesn't happen during executive onboarding and assimilation has the greatest impact on success rates um, more than we picked the right person or the wrong person or the competence or decision-making of the new leader. So um, this is a really good thing to know because when we think about how do we increase the likelihood that our new important new hire is going to succeed, there are things we can do. And I think those things really are um, an effective, well thought out um, orientation, onboarding and integration process. So a couple of things that I've always wanted to tell a group, and that's what I'm going to tell them to you today. This is something I've thought a lot about, again, particularly from a coach's perspective, but I'm, I'm struck by when the leader says yes, what the leader's saying yes to when they say yes to a new job, and by contrast, what the organization is saying yes to. So when a leader says yes, they're saying, yes, I want this opportunity. Yes to this package that you're giving me. Yes to this challenge you've laid out. Yes, I'm willing to move new house, new town, new school, um, move across the country, um, new organizational culture. You know, I'm yes, I'm willing to do that. And yes, I want to be part of your mission, your vision, and your strategy. And I believe I can do this and I have something to contribute. So it's pretty exciting, right? And I think we're, what I'm noticing is an uptick in people saying yes to new jobs in the second half of 2023. We're seeing a lot of people coming on board. Um, and they're doing so with perhaps some trepidation, but a whole lot of excitement and enthusiasm. When the organization extends an offer, it's say it's it's doing so from the premise we believe you you are going to be very effective. We're excited to apply you to our important and often urgent challenges. Uh, we think you'll know what to do. In fact, we've been waiting for you. Um, you know, and 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 uh, we all know what that it is, right? Um, we expect to see almost immediate results as you step in and take seat. Um, in the first 90 days, what can you do? You know, we've been waiting. Time, you know, we took longer than we wanted to get you here. So we're now here you are. Let's see something. We've evaluated your background experience and we believe you'll bring something new and needed. In fact, we probably even gave you a mandate to lead change. 
and not to be afraid or held back by old stories or old habits or old cultural mores, right? We want you to take us someplace new. Um, and we believe that because you're you and we're so excited about you that all will be well, right? So this is fabulous, right? Two big yeses, but reality is almost always different for both parties. Um, and I, I think this is, this is the place where retention or attrition become uh, a topic on one side of the equation or the other, right? For the new leader, it's the feeling of displacement, right? I will every day I wake up at a new house in a new neighborhood. I'm adjusting myself, never mind what my family's going through, right? So I'm jumping in, things are moving fast, important meetings, board meeting, staying late, working weekend, right? And my family and my what's happening in my private life is also undergoing change. Um, okay, they didn't tell me about X, Y, Z, and it's urgent. When do I get to the other priorities? I didn't realize, I didn't know. I thought they were further along than they really are. We had more resources at my last company. Um, I didn't realize how resistant to change people would be. I, I was told to make change. No one seems to want it. Um, I was promised a position on the executive path, but I'm not included in the right meetings. You know, So just from a new leader perspective, there can be a, a disconnect. Um, in fact, e even as recently as a couple of weeks ago, I learned uh, from, from someone about how the job they thought they were saying yes to wasn't at all the job that they walked into and was laid out for them. Um, and I, I, so it's really interesting to think about that exciting yes, and then the inevitable and natural bump as somebody actually lands on board, right? And I say inevitable and natural because I think some of this is just the way it is, right? Reality settling in. From the company's perspective, there's often uh, an elevated expectation um, you know, here are some sample quotes that are real. A listening tour is great, but we expected them to move to action in key areas more quickly. Um, I wish she or he uh, would stop talking about how the old company did things and, and get to know us better. Um, this person's take charge style is not going over well with the team. They miss the old leader. He seems to point out problems everywhere, but doesn't offer solutions. That's why we hired him to solve the problems. I'm not sure she gets our culture. This might not work, right? So often this is when our phone rings, right? Please help us with this leader. Um, we want them to succeed. We're not sure that they will, right? And so when we think about onboarding, I, I, I guess the reason I wanted to talk about this today is simply because I, I want you to understand that the exciting yes naturally transitions into the reality of the first 90 days or the first six months. And in that reality, both parties come to a more grounded understanding of what the job is and what's needed. And that's okay. And you don't want to dis be disconnected or hands off as an important new leader is going through that transition. Um, we know that leaders fail. Um, because they have a poor grasp of how the organization works, or perhaps a misfit with the organizational culture. And there's lots of um, pushback on that idea of, of, mis of, of are you a fit? Are you not a fit? Um, some, sometimes um, that, that in and of itself is worth a webinar. But what stands out to me and what I wanted to point to here is that almost 70% of respondents pointed to a lack of understanding about norms and practices and, and about the culture. And it wasn't so much that we, again, we hired the wrong people or they weren't competent. It's actually that they didn't have what they needed in terms of support to really get up and running. So a couple of other quick points I'd like to make. And the first one here is that onboarding a new leader takes months, not weeks. It's important not to confuse onboarding with orientation. Um, here we have a quote from Roy Moore who says, onboarding is a strategic practice that should take place for at least one year when a new leader is brought on board. Um, in our experience at the Nebo company, onboarding someone and really getting them integrated takes a full 18 months. And I often tell people who join us as new hires, think of it as three six month periods. And at the end of each six months, you are so significantly much farther along than you were at the beginning of the six months, and now you're ready for the next leg of learning. After 18 months, you're going to be ready to go. And so what stands out to me is that nobody wants it to take 18 months, right? The new hire says, I've got things I can contribute. I have ideas, right? And they certainly can and will. Um, the company wants to see results. 
But I think for those of us responsible for the successful transition, um, there are no shortcuts, right? This is at least a 12 month, probably an 18 month process. And you wanna make sure your onboarding is allowing for checkpoints along the, along the way. Um, there are many great programming elements that you can bring into your onboarding program. And our thought today was to make these available to you. Um, I think that um, in the 2020s, we can tap into technology with onboarding portals. We can really uh, choreograph the first day, the first week, and even the first year. Um, uh, there's lots written about the importance of making sure roles and responsibilities are clear, not only of the person you just hired, but also the people in their neighborhood, their peers, um, their teams, making sure they understand why we have which meetings and what the meeting's about and how to participate, right? Um, doing periodic check-ins um, is another good one. Um, and I would say, you know, you can you can go less frequently as time passes, but you certainly don't want to just go every six months. That wouldn't be enough. Um, and you'll notice that in blue, we have onboarding coaching and team development opportunities. And I'm going to say a lot more about those in a second. Um, some other good practices are the assignment of a mentor or a peer mentor or someone you might call a guide or a buddy. Um, Thorough communication strategy for the new role. How are you presenting this person? And are you creating excitement about who they are and giving other people enough of an understanding of the whole person that it doesn't just feel like I'm the new role, right? You want it to, when you're introducing somebody, you want to give enough that people can grasp who this human being is. Um, and then I think also making sure you let them know how important it is for them to spend time with their key stakeholders. Um, many people will will provide even like a map of here are the key relationships for this position. Um, these are the people who's who are invested in the success of the role, but also who you need to cultivate. Um, and then finally, making sure people are getting frequent formal feedback and, and informal feedback, right? And this is one of those places where if we're sitting on feedback, we can actually really um, hold someone back and th the organization can judge them harshly uh, very quickly. Um, so this is, again, just making sure you've got the feedback checkpoints. Um, I often think that when we get together to do those feedback conversations, it helps to ask good coaching questions, right? Good open-ended questions. Like, how are you finding it here? How are you finding us? Any surprises so far? How's it going with your team? Who's been most helpful? What do you need? What do you wish for? I'm always curious about that question. What do you wish for? You'll hear something that you really need to know. Um, where do you feel you're making progress? Uh, what's hard? or taking more time than you thought? And how can I help? Or how can we help, right? And so this little list of questions is a tool that you could use to guide your checkpoint conversations. And again, the aim here is to make sure that we're taking a holistic approach, that we're understanding that human being who's waking up in the new neighborhood in the new bed, not just the leader who's trying to meet that complex challenge. Um, so remember, that 70% of respondents in the global study pointed to a lack of understanding of norms and practices. Um, what could reduce those failure rates? Um, constructive feedback and help navigating internal networks and getting insight into organizational and team dynamics. So how can onboarding coaching help? Um, what I'd like to say is that coaching, because of its confidential nature, because of its high trust nature, and because of its... Um, uh, a, a really, really sort of alignment with both the organization and the leader's success um, can be a critically valuable piece of successfully bringing a new talent on board. So we often find that uh, a great approach in our work, bringing coaching, onboarding and coaching into an onboarding program for someone is to really make sure that we're working closely with HR, building a, a strategic partnership together we believe that we can, through onboarding coaching, support the new leader in five ways through the navigation of the culture, helping them establish the key relationships and not get discouraged or um, uh, affronted or uh, sensitive about those relationships, but to really forge those right relationships effectively, um, helping them to build their team, um, to seek and learn from early feedback, 
um, and to create a personal action plan. And that could be the first 90 days. It could be 30 days. It could simply be, here's my game plan for the next week, right? In terms of all the things I'm prioritizing and taking on, taking in. So again, the coach coaching is a terrific way to ensure that your leader is getting support and has the privacy to talk about what's really going on for them as they come into the organization. I think of a leader I spoke with about a month ago who said, um, I'm a really nice person, but I've been brought in to do a really hard and unpleasant job. And I feel like I'm, people don't even know I'm a nice person. You know, Those are the kinds of things that new leaders can process with their coach. And I think the coach can also be incredibly helpful in helping them bring their authenticity into their leadership. Um, Onboarding coaches focus on far more than leadership development. Um, they act as strategic sounding boards, as trusted guides. They understand the nature of organizations and change. And they also understand um, how to help the leader um, not get in their own way, not psych themselves out, not form negative conclusions too early. Um, again, you'll be able to read this if you want to. I think each of these um, check, check marks um, makes an important point. Um, but I think that from a from an onboarding coaching perspective, I think for those of you who might be in an HR role, I think it's just really important to realize that this isn't just leadership coaching. This is leadership coaching with something extra, with extra awareness and extra background and knowledge about how to help a new leader succeed. Um, many features of an onboarding coaching process. Um, and, you know, from our perspective, um, these features, all of them really contribute, including the possibility of gathering feedback or even advice. Um, very often when I do onboarding coaching, I'll do five interviews of key stakeholders for that leader and ask, what advice do you have for the person who's stepping into this job? And I learn things that help me be a, a good coach to that leader. I also come back with a basket of great advice that enables the leader to quickly um, organize around some of what those who've been around for a while already know. Um, we've shared in this material um, two sample packages, um, mostly just wanted you to see what they could look like. So um, there could be a year long onboarding coaching package. That would be an excellent investment. And it would include a number of things. Um, it would include certainly the coach matching, the coaching sessions, but also some assessments, some interviews, um, and it could even include uh, 360 um, after the six month mark or the 12 month mark. Um, I wanted to share with you a short version. A lot of our clients these days are like, we don't know if we want to go the whole the whole 12 months. Uh, what could you do in the first, you know, uh, the first four months or the first three months? And so again, just really helping um, structure an approach that supplements what the HR team is doing in terms of the onboarding, what the supervisor's doing, um, and that gives real value. And, and we even have some materials that show sort of how, how the flow of these features could look in a four month period. Which one's better? I think it depends very much on the circumstances for the leader, perhaps the level of the leader, um, perhaps the budget. You know, the most important thing is to do what you can to set someone up for success, um, you know, and many onboarding coaches can provide team coaching for the leader's team as well, um, a sort of a team development or team facilitation. I know that this often happens. I'll be coaching someone who's who's new to their position and they'll say, could I bring you in to work with my team to sort of level set for us all and, and help us figure out best ways of working together and how to really become a coherent team. And I would say that if if you um, if you want to do that type of work, it's very effective for the person coaching the leader to also be in a position to help the team form. And, um, you know, we know that again, new person comes in, the new leader is thinking, do I have the right team? Um, how do I get to know them? How do I get to see their strengths? Um, what are the norms we want to establish? Uh, what's the right blend of relationship focus? Um, and outcome focus? How do we get those key results going? Uh, what do I need to do to build trust with them? The team is thinking, we want to know who this leader is. How are things going to change for me? What's expected of me? Uh, what's going to be different? 
Um, do you understand, leader, everything I know and have done for this organization? Um, will I be treated fairly and openly? Can I come to you? Can I trust you? Um, are you are you not going to play favorites? Um, do I have job security, right? So if you look at the left-hand side, you can see just from the get-go, people have anxiety, right, about a transition like this. It can be very helpful to use a team development program, working with the onboarding coach to really bring the team together with the leader and to create a kind of safe, cohesive, and coherent um, program. And typically the coach would interview each team member and then share some insights from that with the leader and then develop possibly a series or a retreat, um, some, some way to help the team really move into establishing their norms. So I would like to just simply say that, you know, when you think about how successful have we been with our onboarding, you might ask the new leader, right? So you might have a formal evaluation, you know, in which they, they everybody who's new um, completes. Um, and then I think also those informal check-ins and feedbacks are going to give you a lot of great information to tweak and improve as you go. Um, you could also look at, did the new leader perform? You know, what were we asking them to do? How did they do at it? And, you know, you could even set goals for the, acc the acclimation to the organization, right? How, how quickly and how smoothly did they come on board? Um, and then thirdly, you could look at retention. Are you improving retention and uh, reducing attrition? Um, you might evaluate metrics like tenure and role once hired and retention of key team members under the leader you've hired, right? If that's important to you. So those are a few thoughts there. And I wanna, I know we only have a few minutes left, but I, I do wanna um, open up to questions. We do have some additional resources here. Um, there's lots out there. Lots of it is before the pandemic. And I think my aim today was to really say, it's 2023. Um, we need to uh, help new leaders who've said a big yes, come in, feel welcomed, feel seen, feel understood, and feel supported so that they can stay and build the momentum that we need them to in our organizations. Um, so I'd like to just pause here and see if anyone has a question or a comment that you'd like to put in the chat. I see lots of things coming in. Yeah, so Kate, I wanted to share some of what's been coming up in the in the chat. And there's a lot of resonance around what you were sharing about organizations and new leaders around expectations versus reality. And there was a question about um, new leaders who were onboarded during COVID and didn't necessarily receive true onboarding. Is there such a thing as a second chance to onboard effectively? Yes, absolutely. So the research is showing us that, um, you know, uh, I, I think the number is 31% of people onboarded in the pandemic struggled to feel connected to their new organization. And I believe that, um, you know, whether you call it onboarding or something else, um, it it's never too late to really reach out, build those connections. And I would recommend that maybe you start with going back again to that sort of list of, of open-ended questions that we offer, just checking in and asking, how has it been? How has it really been? And, you know, what's been your greatest success so far? What, where have you struggled? What's surprised you, right? Those kinds of questions help someone to feel that you noticed that they came on board and you noticed that it's a hard time to come on board. So I would start with that outreach. You're going to learn a lot and that might give you some other ideas about where else to go. Thank you, Kate. We also got a question from Oliver about the team coaching and are there any issues with having the leaders coach facilitate a team session that people should be aware of that they should watch out for like psychological safety? Yeah, it's a great, I mean, it's a great question. And, you know, the team coaching models that are most often in play recommend strongly that the person who coaches the team also be the, the, the coach of the leader of the team. And I will tell you as someone who does team coaching, that my job is to be objective, to be supportive and to work for the success of the team and the success of the leader. When I actually get to know the team, I better understand uh, what the team, who the team members are and what they need. And I better understand how my, my coaching client lead the leader's style 
and perhaps impatience or frustration or um, need for greater emotional intelligence could be playing out with the team, right? So a strong team coach understands how to work with both team and leader effectively. I would not, however, coach each of the individuals on the team. At Nebo, the way we do this is if we if we would like to provide coaching to team members, they have their own coach and that's their private and confidential space for their own development and their own processing. Um, what I don't wanna do is, is set up a situation where there's a conflict of interest or a perception of, um, you know, everything there is to know about me and you know, everything there is to know about the leader and, you know, how are you going to resolve that? I, I do think though, that when you're working as a coach in a team environment, you're working with the whole group at once. And if you're, if you're skilled, you can create safety and have very productive sessions and you can really help the leader to be more effective with their team. It's a great question. We have one more for you, Kate. Um, Judy's asking, when you see a huge mismatch between the leader and the organization, how do you approach it? Yeah, it's an interesting question. And, you know, there's, uh, I was looking at some materials about this um, last week and um, very often the problem began in the hiring process, right? And perhaps the organization didn't have a clear enough idea of what one, what one onboarding expert is calling like the organization's DNA. Right. If an organization knows uh, its DNA, meaning like maybe the three things that people who succeed here ha all have in their pro profile, right? We can typically look for that better in the hiring process. Sometimes you can't, right? Sometimes you bring somebody in and it appears to be a big cultural mismatch. And here I would say um, giving that feedback early on and say, and, and being as specific as possible, you know, you're operating in this way. We typically do things this way. Um, you know, what, you know, that was the poet David White says, we have to learn to speak the language of the kingdom we want to enter, right? So when we join a new organization, we do need to understand the cultural norms and we do need to adapt. And if I were coaching that leader, I would really say, let's make sure you've got the unwritten rules of this culture. Let's make sure we're understanding what it takes to be um, seen as credible and effective in this culture, because you could be right about the issue, but not be viewed as credible or effective as a leader. And so I would say uh, working together, a, a coach and uh, a supervisor can give the feedback and then work with the feedback. And I, I would, I would um, also think that you would want that to show up as a performance comment as early as possible so that if there really is a long-standing issue that, that shows up after the first six months or the first 12 months, you have a record of the concern. Yeah. Thanks. And I think, you know, that the, the topic of fit is again, a, a slippery slope, right? But I think if you can talk specifically about behave, observed behavior, right, that's problematic, that's, that's especially important. Thank you, Kate. Yes, I know we're over our time um, today and, you know, um, we have lots of things covered, lots for you to hopefully take away. We're going to be back again on the 12th to talk about what's changed in, th in the way we're thinking about leadership in the 2020s and hope to see you with us. And um, I would simply like to thank you for taking the time to be with us today and hope that you found something here that sparks some creativity and some new ideas in your efforts to to find and keep the best leaders. Thank you.